Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg and very excited to sit down with the founder and publisher of Outlaw Company, Boneyard Press. Their titles include Dark Angel, Bill the Bull, Outlaw Nation, Jeffrey Dahmer, The Unauthorized Biography, Kill Image, Kill Marvel. Uh, he's no stranger to controversy. Hero Illustrated called him the most dangerous man in comics. Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe, Hart D. Fisher. Guys, I thought things might get a little rough, so I wore my helmet. Very smart, well prepared. Looks like you might have been a Boy Scout whenever you were younger. I was a Boy Scout. <laughs> Isn't that their motto? So, uh, Hart, you're back on our radar because you're back to publishing. And uh, I do want to talk about your origins in publishing, how you got started. But why don't we begin with Build a Bull Omnibus Kickstarter? It just funded. Uh, bringing you back now into your 30 years into comics publishing. Uh, tell us about your new Kickstarter. Well, you know, uh, last year when we had the lockdown with COVID, and I believe it was uh, Marvel and DC have both pulled out of the normal distribution channels. And I can't remember, was it Marvel made the deal with Random House? I think, I think DC did the Random House deal. Okay, so they have pulled their products out of the mainstream distribution. And even though I left comics, uh, a thing that, that folks don't understand is when you're a publisher of comic books, the retailers are your friends if you're smart. And so I have a lot of friendships with a lot of retailers and I've stayed in touch with everybody. I've stayed in touch with a couple of different artists and, you know, guys like Buzz, uh, Buzz from Harris, uh, used to do Vampirella. Uh, so Buzz has been on me about coming back to do comics and several other people have been on me. Uh, Max DeVille wanted to license the entire Boneyard Press catalog and reprint it, and he wanted to reprint Build-A-Bull first, because Build-A-Bull was Max's favorite uh, character. If people at home don't know who Max is, he's the publisher behind Atrocity Press, and Max was a big Boneyard Press fan in high school. He would skip school, light up a joint, and read Build-A-Bull, and that was his thing. So uh, I decided to come back last year because it seemed like it seemed like comics might die. I mean, it seemed like the distribution system was dead, and there was a new way to do things, and I started looking around at what Billy Tucci was doing and what Brian Polito was doing, because these, these are all, you, you know how it is, Jim, in, in the industry, it's a small industry, so you know everybody. And I knew Billy before he started publishing, and I knew Brian before he started publishing, and I wrote for Chaos Comics, and I really liked what those guys did with their fundraising campaigns. And so I had a chip on my shoulder for the longest time about Kickstarter and Indiegogo, but when my wife was dying of colon cancer, I did a fundraiser on GoFundMe for her medical care. And that kind of kicked that chip right off my shoulder. And I realized that Kickstarter and Indiegogo were a very freeing force in the industry. And it allowed artists to communicate directly with their fans and with creators. So I thought now's the time to come back. And originally I always told people, I'm coming back when I got fuck you money. When I got a ton of fuck you money, I'm going to burn it all down. But I wasn't feeling that anymore. Frankly, uh, I've had a lot of crazy stuff happen in my life. And I was my wife's sole caregiver during her, her days uh, battling because it was severe anemia. And the severe anemia went into colon cancer. And she was in a lot of pain. And frankly, that beat the piss out of me. It just literally beat the piss out of me. It just knocked me down and destroyed me. And it really knocked a lot of my anger out of me. You know what I mean? It really took a lot of that anger out. So I was looking for, well, why, why would I come back to comics? And last year, I thought, you know, this is the time. I'm coming up on 30 years because uh, 1991 is when we published our first book, Dark Angel. And it was half Dark Angel, half Build a Bull. And... I felt, well, if the devil's coming back, now is the time to do it when the whole world is locked down and everybody's afraid. You mentioned uh, at the top of this comic retailers, you know, being sort of a friend of the publisher, friend, friend of comic creators, obviously friend of uh -huh. readers. How do the retailers fit into whatever vision you have for where you're at now and where you're going? Well, you know, what I've seen in the industry is consistently the, quote, leaders of the business have led the business into the dirt. You know, why aren't, why aren't there 99 cent Batman comics at the movie theaters when every Batman is released? That'd be the smartest way to grow your audience. Why aren't they doing that? 
why aren't they out at rock concerts? I mean, people probably don't know that I ran Verotic, Glenn Danzig's comic company. And one of the ideas I came up with and really pushed and made happen was to create the Verotic booth that went on tour with Glenn. And by the end of the first tour they were doing that, the, the, the comic book uh, booth made as much money as the T-shirt booth. And that's a lot of money. And I also worked with Rob Zombie in the late 90s trying to create a traveling comic book store that would go on tour with him. But the leaders of the industry, they didn't understand it. They didn't get it because, uh, you know, readership in comics is a growth business. So what are my plans for retailers? Well, I was going to drop a bomb on, on your show. The idea is, look, I've been working with Gary Guzzo to get comics back into drugstores, back into reader racks, back into 90, get them into 99 cent stores, get them into truck stops. So I've been working with, Matt, with with Gary about that. And I've also, we've been working on the idea of getting comics into vending machines, okay? And creating products that are affordable. Frankly, folks, comics have gotten too expensive. Now I know the tiers on my Build a Bull are, are like my digital tier is 20 bucks. But you're getting over 325 pages of stuff. You're getting every single Build a Bull story that was ever published, ever published. You're getting uh, original art from John Cassidy that, that is never, it's John Cassidy's first published work. It is Duncan Rouleau's first published work. And you're gonna get all this great stuff and we're making really cool vinyl stickers and really cool bookmarks and buttons. Cause I worked in the, in the industry in advertising. So making products and delivering products is really easy for me. To publish and print is easy for me. That's the, the hard part is the campaign. And we did hit our goal, so we did hit the goal. So now I've got a lot of really cool backer rewards. But coming back in the retailers, a, a big thing I want to do is I want to get back into like publishing on newsprint. I like newsprint. I like the feel of the paper, and I like the way the ink sticks with the paper. So that's something I want to get back into is offset printing instead of just print on demand. Here goes our first tangent. Now you got me talking about printing and newsprint. I actually did uh, one of the rewards for my Kickstarter last summer was a newsprint edition of the comic uh, that I made, Octobriana. Um, and I learned that there was a big web press in Wisconsin. You're based in Wisconsin now, I believe. Yes, I'm in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Have you, uh, you know, have you reached out? Have you found printers that can do what you want to do? And if so, any local printers? Um, how does that all work? Are you involved in that side of the, you know, kind of the production side of what you're doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm deeply involved in it. That's the thing about Boneyard Press is it was it was it was me. I, I did it all. I, I handled the distributor. I did all the advertising. I did all the graphic design. I handled the printer. I handled the shipping. I handled the advertising. I handled the appearances, all the scheduling. I'm a maniac and I'm a really hard charging guy and I very rarely sit still. You know what I mean? Uh, I only sit still like my, my version of taking a break is I do the American Horrors Film Festival. And right now I've got 115 submissions to this year's festival. It's our fifth year. We do the festival in uh, downtown Lake Geneva at the Imagine Theaters. And that's my break. But my buddy, Trike, who runs a comic shop over at Comic Alley, is like, Hart, you're still working. Everything you do to take a break is work. Like you think doing an interview is a break from work. <laughs> but it's work like uh the this summer i did 50 hours of podcasting you know to talk to people and let them know i'm back and i i hit every show i could hit to let people know i'm back because that's how boneyard did it is boneyard was everywhere we were in head shops we were in snm shops we were at rock concerts we were everywhere that's the point is you've got to reach your readership you, you've got to get out there you've got to promote You've got to get the book into people's hands. And that's what I like about Kickstarter is it really does enable you to show so much art because this weekend I'm going to be adding a lot of stuff to the Hearty Fisher Buildable Omnibus Kickstarter. I'm going to be adding a lot of cool art, a lot of new stuff. Uh, Mark Bloodworth uh, just came on board. So we started with about 325 pages, but the book keeps getting bigger. <laughs> so Mark Bloodworth has been doing these really cool vintage style comic ads from like 70s comics, only they're grown up, they're grown up. So there's nudity in them and stuff. And so in the buildable omnibus, we've got new artwork by Mark Bloodworth. That is these really good, buy your own inflatable succubus. <laughs> <laughs> they're really good, they're really great. Sorry, but it's getting hot under that helmet, folks. <laughs> well, we, we won't be too rough on you. Uh, 
Hart, this is maybe a good segue to go back to the beginnings of Boneyard Press. You know, the 90s, if you watch Cartoonist Kayfabe, uh, that's when Ed and I really kind of got invested in comics in that decade. And Boneyard starts in 1991. So you're, you're very yep. prolific throughout that entire 90s decade. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why start publishing? I, I read that you were grew up a Marvel kid, like many, mm -hmm. many readers, many people our age did. Um, you went to school, I believe uh, you have an art and uh, an art degree. Yep. So you start Boneyard Press before you graduate. And I guess my question is, why be a publisher? You know, a lot of us loved comics, wanted to wanted to be a comic book artist, for example. So can you tell me a little bit about what made you start? What made you decide you wanted to be a publisher in the beginning? Uh, well, you know, I, I've loved comic books since I was five years old. And one of my best friends as a kid, uh, Patty, he was four, I was five. And Patty gave me Archie, Richie Rich, Little Lulu, Casper the Friendly Ghost, all those, those kid books. And that's what I started reading. And I went from that and I read everything I could get my hands on. I just was, a, I, I'm, I'm a voracious uh, consumer of culture. I read everything. I read everything. That's why it's hard to lie to me about this current uh, pandemic. Got a lot of doctor friends. I'm a lifelong martial artist. Uh, Shang-Chi, Master of Kung Fu, was my favorite comic book growing up as a kid because I knew I wasn't rich. I couldn't be Batman. I knew I wasn't going to get bit by a spider, a radioactive spider. But damn it, I could be Master of Kung Fu. So I, I love the books and I drew comics since I was five. I started drawing them. And I've been writing and drawing my own books since then. And a lot of people are finding out now how deep my relationships go in publishing and with other like people like Brian and, and, and Billy Tucci. Uh, and when I say Brian, I mean Brian Polito. Uh, he's now Coffin Comics was chaos. Uh, I was buddies with Dan Matson, the publisher at North Star. Me and Dan Matson, we are friends since grade school, like grade school. And so Dan and I also went to the same high school, Project Individual Education, PI, on the south side of Chicago, that was a school for, uh, well, really smart kids. And it was all about teaching kids how to take responsibility for their lives and preparing them to be adults. So Dan and I had been trying to do comics together the whole time. And I went off to college. I went to the U of I in Champaign-Urbana to study art. And... Dan went on to do North Star and he published Faust. So I was there at the beginning of Faust. I was there running Dan's booth at the Chicago Con while he had the North Star booth. I was running his comic booth, selling books to pay for the, the publishing. <laughs> so I was right there with Tim Vigil and, and David Quinn. I've known those guys from the beginning. I remember Grips. I, ha I used to buy Grips, which was one of Tim's early, early books before Faust. So I, I was a huge only one huge claw fan. for anybody at home that's yeah. unfamiliar with grips. <laughs> Didn't figure yeah, out the only, formula until he added that second claw. Totally, dude. <laughs> totally. And and I was highly influenced by Faust and Steve Bissett's attitude with uh, doing Taboo and Tundra was very influential on me. But the reason I really became my own publisher was Mark Beecham. Uh, folks who don't know who Mark Beecham is, Mark was a, a independent artist in the, the days of the 90s, and he did really sexy stuff. His art was very, uh, look a lot like Neil Adams. And he came he out of continuity, I think, because he did a book for them called Samurai, or Samurai, I'm not sure how you yeah. pronounce it, but, but he was, I think, the original artist on that title uh, from Neil Adams' you know, publishing studio. Well, I met, I met Mark because <laughs> <coughs> Mark was a uh, like most artists, it's difficult to get you bastards to produce. <laughs> and I, I, I have my own problem with this. So getting an artist to, to work is tough. So the, um, Dan found out the only way he could get Mark to, to do, because he was working on the, the, the Faust book, uh, The Talons of Faust, with the female Faust. And the work was amazing. But the only way Dan could get him to do it is he was living out of the North Star offices. Mark was living in the North Star offices. So... I had recently been let go from a job that I had, uh, Clark Mosquito Spray. I was driving a mosquito spray truck all night, 12 hours a day. And Mark and I were out at the movies, and Mark is like, Hart, why, why do you want to go be a slave on somebody else's Spider-Man? Why don't you make your own Spider-Man? And I thought about that, and I'm like, yeah, why, 
And he goes, everything you create, if you, because I wanted to work for Marvel. I wanted to draw for Marvel and DC and write for them. And he's just like, they're going to own everything you create. They're going to own everything you create. And they're going to treat you like crap. I mean, the way DC has treated Alan Moore is reprehensible. The way Marvel treated Jack Kirby is reprehensible. And that's a big part of why I did stuff like the Marvel Can Suck My Cock shirt. And I sued Marvel Comics for copyright and trademark violations. And I won. I won. But no one's heard about that. Because the big, the big powers don't want you to know how strong you are. That's a big reason why there's been a whitewash on me. And they've tried to wipe my contribution to comics history out. But ha, 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 I'm hard to bury, folks. I'm really hard to bury. Hart, what, what would you say your contribution to comics is? Do you think about legacy and, and you know, what mark you've left on the industry? What do you want to be known for so far? That's a, that's a tricky question because you could say what you want to be known for, but that isn't necessarily what you're going to be known for. Uh, and I'm not sure what I would say I want to be known for, but what I believe I'm known for is the fact that you, there's no stopping me. I'm unstoppable. I'm a goddamn juggernaut. There's absolutely no way to stop me. You're going to have to put a bullet in my face, a stake in my heart, cut my head off, put it in the fucking river, burn my body, put silver in the bottoms of my feet. I mean, I'm, I'm trouble. And the thing is, is I speak truth. I speak truth and I speak truth to power. And that's a big thing right there. And I think that's something that I'm, I'm going to be known for. And people are going to remember me is because I've been myself, no matter what they box, they tried to put me in, no matter what hole they tried to bury me in. I just kept coming back and beating them at their own game because Boneyard did good. We sold a lot of books. We sold a lot of books. We didn't, we weren't underground at all. And, and you won't see my work in most price guides because there's, there's people that are trying actively to suppress my work. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that, okay, uh, I wish Ed had been here because I wanted to talk with Ed on the air about Red Room, you know? And I wanted to give him some tips on how to make it hurt more. I really <laughs> want to talk to Ed and help him make it hurt more. I've been reading his book and I, I really like what he's doing with it. I could see my own influence on his work. I like it very much. I think his art is fantastic. Uh, I like his art a lot. Uh, and the thing about Outlaw Publishing is I can get bitchy about that title. I can get really bitchy about it. And my feeling on it is I paid the price to be an outlaw. I had stalkers. I had death threats. People robbed my house because the news broadcast I was at a Fangoria convention in Los Angeles. Uh, I... I, I had to carry a gun for a little while in the 90s because I had so many death threats and stalkers and weirdos. And, you know, you're an outlaw publisher when the police come to your fucking house and ask you to leave town. And that happened. So my feeling is true outlaw publishing is about striking a nerve like Michael Diana. Uh, I am one of the only publishers of Michael Diana. And the police did tell me not to publish his work. And Diamond banned his work. So I put Michael's work in the pages of Flowers and the Razor Wire and just didn't tell Diamond. I just did it. And I put, I put those guys at the C, the Comic Legal Defense Fund, I put their feet to the fire and let them know that if you don't stand up for Mike, I'm going to reveal to the public how you screwed me over and how you abandoned me during my fight with the Dahmer books. And they stuck with him all the way. They, they, but the Supreme Court wouldn't hear his case. So I did publish the only cartoonist in America to go to jail for his art. That's outlaw publishing, folks. It's not a label. It's a thing. It's a real thing. I paid the price. My friends have been murdered, you know, my friends have died of suicide, drug overdoses. My loved ones have been raped and beaten. I am a victim of violent crime. I've been beaten. I have been sexually assaulted. I have had a woman try to rape me, you know, after the, the death of my wife. So my work comes from a real place. It has emotional underpinnings. And I think that's the thing that gets people. It's why A Taste of Cherry in Veronica 4 left such a mark, because it had emotional underpinnings. And that's the key to being an outlaw publisher is you got to find that nerve. You got to work it. You got to work right. it. That's a lot. 
let, let me let me say a few things for people who are watching at home and may be unfamiliar with a few of the of the things you've said. Mike Diana, sure. for anybody unfamiliar, there's a documentary about him. He's a cartoonist. I believe his work was seized in Florida, uh, yep. faced prosecution there for obscenity. Um, I, you know, was found guilty, as, as you say, Hart, you know, maybe the only artist in America that was forbidden to draw is, is uh, you know, from Correct. a legal standpoint. And there is a documentary about Mike Diana for anybody that is unfamiliar or wants to know a little bit more about, about him. Um, you mentioned, oh man, my notes, I'm, I'm on the road. So my notes are a little <laughs> bit scattered right now. Um, but you mentioned Veronica number four and yeah. this story, and I, I don't have it right. A Taste of Cherry was busted at Planet Comics in Oklahoma. Um, I believe it's still banned in the state of Oklahoma, banned in Correct. Canada, banned maybe in a couple of other places as well. Uh, so, you know, face you, legal battles that you faced uh, on obscenity charges or that retailers faced on obscenity charges for comics that you created. Uh, in that case, I think it was published by Verotic. You edited those. So you have been through court for a few of your comics that have come out. Yeah. Uh, whenever you refer to outlaw comics or to these court cases, um, those are some of those examples. Uh, you know, one of the things that looking at your work and preparing to talk to you a little bit that I was curious about is you've described a lot of hardship coming from this kind of work. Um, and I don't know mm -hmm. the best way to describe it, but extreme work, work of an extreme nature. What's the value well, in it, that work? What makes it worth it, going through is, that kind of suffering for? The thing is, OK, you're an artist. Unless you hire me and pay me for a job, I don't get to decide what I create. People don't understand that. And when I co-wrote A Taste of Cherry, no one ever asked me why I did it. No one ever asked me, Hart, where did this come from? They just said, you're evil. What kind of terrible person are you for writing this stuff? And I'm going, don't you guys read Clive Barker? Don't you read John Skip and Craig Spector? Don't. Don't you read Frangoria? Don't you even read about real crime? Because I studied criminology. So I grew up on the south side of Chicago and it was normal for me to see my friends beaten up by their fathers in front of me with their fists. Hello. So when someone goes, how could you write that? I'm like, how could I not? I had to make it as honest as possible. The book is honest. My stories are honest. Violence is honest ugly in my stories because violence is goddamn ugly and so people get mad at me i'm working through my own issues i i've had a lot of violence in my life and when i did a taste of cherry my girlfriend michelle had been raped and murdered in a hotel robbery while making my movie the garbage man and it was a horrible sex crime and i was in the middle of the dahmer stuff so i had a lot of dark things happening in my life and my girlfriend before that was raped by a stalker who kidnapped her out of her apartment, nearly murdered her. And he got away with it because he was a cop's kid. How do you like them apples? My girlfriend before that was raped by my coworker at the bar I was a bouncer at. Why was my work dark? Why the fuck do you think my life is dark? I have to write this work. Poems for the Dead, my poetry, that's just a raw wound of madness coming out of me. Those poems would just, they were like a seizure. And I, I just have to find a scrap of paper and write them down. And I had these scraps of paper all over my house. Uh, I, I will, I'll admit I'm, I'm in therapy. I have post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, I'm, in I'm in therapy with a doctor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Savage, who is an Afghanistan war veteran. And so She's the one that diagnosed me with PTSD. And I've been beaten up by a group of guys. I've had people hold me down and beat me up. So why is the work dark? <laughs> why isn't it darker is the real question. On a, on, a, on a larger scale, because obviously yours is not the only dark work that's out there. You know, it's a sure, popular, sure. It's, it's, it's popular subject matter, I think, for a lot of people. I wonder if you hear from your readers, um, you know, is that a cathartic experience for some of them reading that? Is that something that, that is part of your experience as an artist, uh, you know, with an audience? Yes. Yes. Uh, here's an example. Here, here's a good example. Uh, when my wife 
okay, social media is new, right? So a lot of the kids have grown up with this, but but I'm used to my poetry. I'm used to doing spoken word. I'm a performer. I have been doing spoken word performances for 30 years, uh, you know, and I've done it all over the world. I'm known for it. I've, I've been on stage with a Pulitzer Prize winning poet. He liked my work. The slam poetry teams have tried to recruit me, but I wasn't going to use my pain as a comp competitive performance. I wouldn't do that. So for myself, I have met so many hurt, hurt, damaged people that were processing pain like mine. And there, there was, I remember a girl who came up to me at a show and she had poems for the dead and she'd read it so much that it was falling apart. It was falling apart and she had it highlighted. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, that stuff really moves me. I'm, I'm getting teary even talking about it. it, it that, that stuff, the, the connection I have with my fans is powerful. And it's why I refuse to kowtow to the censors. It's why I refuse to back down. And here's an example. I started writing new poetry when my wife died. I, I broke. <laughs> I broke. And I broke again. I've been a broken man many times. And every time I've broken, I've come back better. And my shrink talked about a, a bomb guy in Afghanistan, an Afghani bomb guy. And he had a saying over there that every time you break glass, the shards get sharper. You get more sharp edges. And she said, Hart, you're just like that. You're like that. And so I am sharper. The work I'm doing now, the new writing I'm doing, because I, I never quit creating. I do American horrors. I write and direct films. And I, my writing that I've been doing now is, is really, 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 really dark. It's really, really dark way darker than the other stuff. And I've got this friends of mine, I started writing this new poetry and I was putting it on Facebook and people thought they didn't understand that it's poetry. So some of my friends were just having a conniption. They were having an utter conniption. They're like, heart, stop posting this. For the love of God, stop posting this stuff. I need the strong heart back. And they all wanted strong heart back. They all wanted that guy back. And I wrote about what was going on with, with Waka, and I wrote about what happened to her, the pain she was going through, the pain I was going through. And so all these people who told me to shut up, I got a fuck you, a real fuck you. And these are some of my friends, and here's the fuck you. Right after my wife died of colon cancer, one of my close friends in Los Angeles got colon cancer. And Toby's wife contacted me after he passed and said, Hart, Everything you wrote on Facebook helped me deal with Toby. Thank you so much for what you wrote. It really helped me handle Toby to deal with his pain because Toby was in a lot of pain. And so was my wife. Guys, when you can't sleep at night because your wife is moaning and you can't do anything for her pain, your work's going to get fucking dark. And so I have some stuff I need to express in my art that wasn't coming out in American Horrors, the television network, which is available for free on Roku or online. Go to AmericanHorrorsFilmFestival.com or the new Boneyard Press 2020.com and you can watch it online for free there. But I have new Poems for the Dead volumes coming out. So we're getting to be publishing new work. And to be honest with you, my focus at Boneyard is going to be the core characters. So after we reprint these old books, we're doing new stuff. And that's what I was kind of talking to you about some things. And I'm aging the characters 20 years. So these characters are going to have a progression instead of just being, how do we figure out why Captain America is still young and now he's in the 90s, now he's in 2021? You know what I mean? It, that, that's, that's crap. So my characters actually age and grow and, and move forward. And that's where we're going to go with it. And I think I think that this Kickstarter thing and, and this podcast revolution has been freeing for me because I, I was a victim of fake news. They totally lied about me in the press. The comics press lied about me. The news people lied about me. They distorted my history. They distorted my work. And so now I get to communicate uh, directly with people. I get to look the camera in the eye and the camera can get to know me and, and I can talk with you and express myself. And so this, this day and age is really freeing. That's interesting. 
in that, uh, you know, again, preparing for this, preparing to talk to you, I knew you from probably, you know, a few of your bigger controversies, uh, but they come from promo, you know, like you were a guy who was promoting comics in a way that no one else was promoting. You were getting press that no one else in comics was getting press. And I'm referring to, you know, in the nineties, um, you were on day, daytime television, uh, you know, talking about the comics you were making. Um, at the beginning of this, you talked about the campaign being a hard part of Kickstarter for you. And I was surprised to hear that because I think of you as this promotional guy, you know, very good at being a promoter of your work, mm -hmm. of the work that you publish. I feel like that is uh, right in line with what you're describing with Kickstarter coming along with podcasts being a place where the, the levels of filtration between you and your audience are fewer and fewer. In some cases, it's a direct, a direct line from you to an audience. And I wonder how much you think about that in terms of promotion from your past up till now. Is it something that you talk to your peers and comics about? Because again, I don't see other people doing the kind of promotion that you've been doing really for 30 years. I'm going to, let me think for a second um, and I'm going to put my shirt on. Okay. <laughs> I was starting to feel like I was in a porn set there for a minute. Okay, I, start, so, I started getting nervous whenever uh, promo comes up and you decide to put on your shirt. I wasn't sure what was going to be on that shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, there's, there's a gag. Okay, a, a lot of people don't know or don't remember that I was going to be Evil Ernie's monthly writer right when the industry started really collapsing at the end of the 90s. Uh, I was very close with Brian and Fran. Uh, we're friends. Uh, I... I, I really enjoyed my time writing for Chaos, and I, I kind of wanted to write for them because I had been getting such a, a reputation that people were ignoring the quality of the writing. And I know I'm a good writer. I, I, I know I'm a good writer. And so I was hired to do the monthly Evil Ernie book, and this relates to the t-shirt gag, right? So uh, when they canceled, they 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 killed my story arc i was going to be exploring evil the idea was evil ernie was going to explore what is evil am i evil i am man so uh that was exciting i was really excited to do that i was working with uh, a fantastic artist that i worked with on homicide uh burnt the, the dead king and we had several issues were done and in the can but brian's sales were just going through the floor and Brian decided I got to come back on as Brian Polito and I got to write these. So I got a really good kill fee. I was paid. I was totally paid. I was paid for the books. And then the other stuff, I got a kill fee. And I'm like, wow, Brian was really nice about that. And Philip Nutman was my editor. And Phil's like, well, Hop, you might show up at a show where the Brian Polito could suck my cock t shirt. So I'm kind of known for being this counter puncher and being able to capture people's attention. And when I left comics, I really thought that I really thought that there was going to be a dozen heart fishers. I thought there was going to be a dozen new guys that were going to come in and do the stuff I did. And I didn't quite realize how original I was because I was so wrapped up in my wars. Remember, there were actually most people don't know there were three murder trials like my girlfriend was raped and murdered. I had to testify in this shit. There were three different trials over the course of 10 years. And I had to testify with my father. My father was the last person to talk to her. He's lucky to be alive. If he'd walked up to the hotel lobby five minutes sooner, my father would have been dead too. So that shit made me crazy. It made me so angry. I was so furious. I went from being an honor roll kid who never drank didn't do any drugs. And I went to start, I, the 90s, I was drinking myself to sleep every night. That was the only way I could go to sleep was to drink myself to sleep. Because every time I'd get my life back on track, this wound would get ripped apart and each trial was worse than the last. It was dirtier and nastier. The defense was more evil. It's nothing like what you guys see in the movies at all. It's, it's horrible. It's absolutely God awful. So. Let's get back to your question. Could you could you re-ask me that question? Well, I I, I wonder about promo. You you know okay, you're promo. a really good promo, and I mean that's all. I, I don't know who else in comics really is. Stan Lee, maybe. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's it's a short list of guys in comics who are a good promo, and you did it 
several times with, you know, from, from Marvel can suck your cock t-shirts, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer for good or bad generated a ton of publicity. You were doing daytime, you know, TV shows. Um, it just seems like you were very good at generating a wide variety of promo. Um, some maybe notoriety in some cases, but also legitimate stuff. Interview Frank Miller, interview Rob Liefeld. You know, there was a lot of stuff that you were doing that kept you uh, sort of at the front of, say, indie publishing. And, you know, everybody else would want to be there. We, we all want to promote our books. You seemed better at it than everyone else. And I wondered about some of that, where that comes from, how much you think about it. If there were influences that you were pulling from. Yeah. Uh, okay. How do I put this? All right. A lot of folks in life, like we talked about Chang Chi, Master of Kung Fu, right? So we'll go to my parents. My parents were both highly educated. Both my parents had degrees in psychology. Uh, my father was a very likable, likable man. He was really funny. My joke is, is my dad looked like, what if Chuck Norris had a bad perm, never did karate and, and was chubby? That was my pop. So my dad was really funny and people loved my dad. Uh, and he was a salesman. So he sold pro kids, pro kids when I was a child. And he had a, had his own roofing company for a while. And my mom is very active. And so I was raised differently than I think a lot of other kids. I was taught the value of money because I worked for my parents so I could go buy my comics. You know what I mean? So when it comes to promotion, I, I love comics. I really love comics. I've loved them since I was, I was five. And I have wanted to be involved in comics since I was five. And the idea of promotion, that, that's an interesting thing because people think I did the Dahmer book to get famous. And it's like, no, in fact, it wasn't even my idea. Dan Matson at North Star, it was his idea. I was bored with serial killers. I was really into serial killers uh, when I was in high school. But frankly, folks, once you get into the psychology of these guys, they're boring as hell. They're not interesting. They can't get it up. They're impotent. They don't, <laughs> screw that, man. I like to fuck. I like sex, okay? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's kind of how it is. If, if, and, and I did the Dahmer book, my, my buddy Dan. Dan's like, hey, Hart, have you, have you heard of this Dahmer guy? And I'm like, no, I'm kind of bored with serial killers. And I was doing Dark Angel and Build a Bull. And uh, I published a, a book called Rectum or Rectum, which is the first uh, Russian comic published in America. Thanks for the credit, comic industry. I really appreciate it. And uh, so some reporter in Milwaukee bought the Dahmer book and took it to the victim's homes. That's how that all started, is some reporter ambush interviewed these poor, poor people. How would you like that? Your, your kid's murdered and some asshole shows up on your doorstep with a camera and shoves a book in your face? Uh, dude, that's, that's horrible. So that's where it started. But the promotion idea, I think it really came, I went to the Chicago Con when I first started publishing uh, the, the Chicago Comic Con and it's before Wizard World took it over. And this is like 91. And I'd already been to a show with Dan. And so I had the, the value of, I worked for Dan. I worked at North Star. I worked in the office. I did stuff. I shipped orders. I did things. And the guys taught me stuff. They, they, Mark Bernal was a guy over at, at uh, uh, North Star. And he really taught me uh, how to do the business. And so I was at the show and I'm looking at everybody and I'm looking around the show and I'm seeing all these artists with their head down and they're not talking to anybody. They're not selling anything. And why am I at the show? Am I there to stare at my page? I could do that at home. I want to meet fans. I want to sell my books. I want to get new readers. So I did an experiment where I, I said, okay, for a half hour, I'm going to be like those other guys. I'm going to be like them. And I'm going to sit here and be mellow. And I'm going to draw little sketches and shit. I didn't sell shit. Nothing came off that table. Nothing happened. So that's where I call it the Mork from Orc sales persona came from. And that's where I became that. You know, you got a Slayer shirt on, but you're not buying a Boneyard book. Get over here, you pussy poser. You poser jag off. And I would show up at shows with no money. I did it to myself to make myself sell. If I didn't sell, I didn't eat. And so I created that beast. And when the news media got a hold of me, that was an education. 
reaction. Oh my God, was that an education? Holy shit, I wasn't prepared for that at all. Folks at home, I could tell you this. The mass media are a pack of liars. They're liars, they're liars, they're liars. They lie and they lie and they lie. CNN did this interview with me where they took the answers to one question and they edited it so it was the answer to a different question. That's disingenuous. That's deceitful. That's a fucking lie, CNN. The newspapers all lied. They all lied. They did it because they needed a sensation. The news media created the sensation, and I was a victim of it. It fucked up my life. You have no idea. that All that Dahmer shit, it fucked up my life. It fucked up my mom's life. My mom worked for the Department of Public Aid, and I get, this, this is where I'm... I, I, fucking hate you sons of bitches in the mass media and it's part of why i have my own tv network so it's going to be real hard to smear me now you sons of bitches the stuff that they're doing to joe rogan right now this this crap they're pulling on him it's like hey guys he got covid he cured it he's fine quit picking on the guy why don't you listen to him and he'll help some people here you jagoffs so uh they lie and they lie and they lie and so i learned that i couldn't fight them they were too big there was nothing I could do, guys. I couldn't fight them. I was being bullied. I was being bullied by the mass media. And the only way I could do, handle it was I had to roll with the punches. I had to go with it. I had to go with it. It became so bad that when Wizard did their article on me, they did like a five or six page article on me, they wanted to be more Hart Fisher. So instead of writing about the fact that I had a nice dinner with the writer at my new house with my new girlfriend and, and, I was in L.A. and we, we had really nice time drinking wine in front of the fireplace and just talking. No, they needed something that was more Hart Fisher. So they they lied and said that we were at Jumbo's Clown Room, which was a really dive bar strip club in L.A. So they lied to make it more sensational. This isn't this isn't me. This is them. So when you guys look on the media, you should question yourself. Why is YouTube censoring doctors? That doesn't compute. Why is Facebook fact checking your personal conversations? When did we need a cyber bully to say, no, uh, let me tell you, you're missing context in your conversation. I feel that the context is this. So therefore, let me artificially inject into your private conversation you're having publicly. Can you imagine being online at a movie theater to go to a movie, talking with your wife? And some jag off is standing there behind you going, you can't say that. Or that's missing context. Or, you know, that Trump guy's really bad. Or, but, but. can you imagine that? This is, this is part of the craziness of this age is, is this school monitor crap. You cannot trust Facebook. You cannot trust Snopes. Snopes was caught. The owner of Snopes. Oh, my God. The owner of Snopes is a liar. He's a liar who, who's been lying for years and deceiving his audience for years, and he's supposed to be the fact checker. Folks, run away, run and hide. These people are scumbags. These people are liars. So when you talk about promotion, I was a guy getting beaten by waves, and I had to learn to surf. I had to learn to surf to save my life. It was making me crazy. It was destructive to my relationships. Okay, I faked my own death in 1998 for April Fool's Day, and people think it was a prank. It was done for publicity. No, it wasn't done for publicity. I did it because I was tired of everybody whispering about me behind my back, everybody lying about me. So I faked my death so I could hear you assholes come out and actually piss on my grave in public. I wanted to hear the shit you were lying about me, and I wanted to hear that stuff. But actually, the prank really didn't go the way I thought it was going to go. I found out that people really loved me. And that was eye-opening because I'd been so beaten up because I was so downtrodden from the murder trials and from the lawsuits. And I was so beaten up and I was so furious with, I wanted to get my hands on this guy who raped and killed my woman. So I was training in martial arts like a guy going to jail. You know what I mean? I was training hard with Go Korchevichian and Gene the Bell. I, I'm, I was a very angry guy. How much time so did you the, spend with Gene LaBelle? Oh, all the time. I'm, I've been at his house. You can see me choked out online. Go look at uh, Harkey Fisher <laughs> training with his sensei. You can see Gene LaBelle choke me out. Uh, I was working on a book for Gene. I'm, I was the voice at Gokor's Highest Academy. Uh, you know, 
For Gokorjevician, press 101. For Paul Bullion in boxing, press 103. Uh, so I am highly trained. Uh, that's where I got to meet Anne Maria de Mars. Uh, Anne Maria is a, a friend of mine. And uh, hi, hi, Anne Maria. I miss you. Because uh, I, I, I left all my friends and tra training partners behind in LA when I moved to Wisconsin. So I know Gene better than you could believe. I know so much stuff about Gene because uh, I was I was going to do a book for him, a bio book. I was going to write it and I was going to go interview all these people. And that project got got pushed to the side because Gene had some other legal issues and an issue with a different writer and a different book. But I know these guys real well. Like, uh, I was wasted and I was dancing with his wife and rubbing Gene's belly. How about that? I was going to ask for a Gene LaBelle story. That sounds good. Well, I, I, there's a, there's a thing in the dojo. It's, it's called uh, an attitude adjustment. So if you're mouthy or if you're being an asshole, or if you're being too rough on your training partners, they're going to send a guy to uh, adjust your attitude. So how well do I know Gene the bell? I've practically had that guy's balls across my nose in the north south position as he's demonstrating techniques. And the north south position is 69, if you don't know what that is. And so I'm in this position and he's just demonstrating the techniques to the to the class. So you're you're on your back and Gene's ass and it's right there because he's got to sit up to talk to the class and tell him, well, what I'm gonna do here is. And so it, at the dojo, my nickname is Big Brother. Big brother, get out here. And my own real brother was called Medium Brother. And, he, and my training partner, uh, Chuck, was called Little Brother. Little Brother, Big Brother, get out here. So I know these people really well, really well. <laughs> mm. But I had my attitude adjusted. Because what happens is, is Gene will tell a joke. And he'll get you in a move. And he'll have you in the submission hold. And he'll apply a little pain. And he'll, he'll go... Ah, oh, look at the rhythm on that guy. Ah, oh, look at the rhythm. Oh, he's got good rhythm. Look at this guy. And he'll make different jokes. And one of his is, is he does, who's best looking? Who's best looking? And you better say Gene LaBelle or <laughs> you're going to get hurt more because that's the thing is he's a master. He's a ninth degree black belt in judo. I knew all about the Steven Seagal story. His, his wife Midge told me about it because for years, Gene legally couldn't talk about it. He signed a non-disclosure agreement with the studio. I know everything about that story. So, <laughs> so Gene, I, I stole Gene's punchline. I didn't let him set up the joke. I just started, when he got me in the hole, I just started going, Gene's best looking, Gene's best looking. And he got this look on his face. He got so goddamn mad. He just put me in move after move after move. And he just tortured me in front of the class. Just tortured me. Every limb was locked into some weird position. And you couldn't tap or you're like Monte, Monte. and you're just you're just hoping to god that nothing's going to snap and i never stole gene's punchline ever again my attitude was completely adjusted all right uh i want to get back to comics a little bit here and the promotion I, i'd like to talk a little more about the promotion oh we'll continue carry on okay so i was thrown into the mass media cauldron and I learned that I had to surf with it. So I learned this and I learned what worked and what didn't work because I, I'm a highly driven person. I'm highly motivated. I'm highly organized. You know, I was on the swim team. I was captain of the swim team sophomore year. You get what I mean? You, you don't become captain of the swim team sophomore year because you suck. Yeah, and swimming's the, swimming, uh, the, the, one of the more brutal sports when it comes to training because it's wake up yeah. early in the morning, you mm -hmm. go swim when you're cold. <laughs> Uh, uh -huh, yeah, that's uh -huh. that's one of the tougher uh, the tougher sports for the training part of it. For real. So I'm a highly organized, highly motivated man, and I'm highly educated, and I want to win, and I want to have fun, and I like I said, I love comics. So I love doing Boneyard, and I wanted everybody to read them. I wanted everybody to see this work. I, I, I'm still to this day. I'm very proud of my people. I'm so proud of my artists. I'm so proud of the fact that Gerard Way was working with me at 15. Uh, I got Gerard Way on the Sally Jesse Raphael show, mind you, as a kid with his mom. I used to have conversations with his mother about how to keep him from being bullied in school. So I was highly involved with, with my people. And I, I did a lot of internships with a lot of damaged young guys that, that were, were hurting and had bad households. And, you know, so 
I really cared about my people. I cared about my books. Uh, I have I have a big big heart. I'm I'm full. I'm full of love. That's why I'm so mean. Because when you got a giant heart, you got to protect it because people will walk all over you. And that's something I learned from guys like Gene the Bell. Gene's a beautiful man. That guy's a really kind, lovely man. But also, do not make that man mad. For the love of God, don't make him mad. So the promotion was about wanting to get it out there, wanting to get people to read the books. And I just got better and better at it and better and better. And we, when I did the talk shows, okay, how do you get better at it? Well, my friends and I would sit down and like the first time I was on a talk show was a closer look with Faith Daniels. And when we, we got the show, we watched it. And my friends tore me apart. They ripped me a new asshole. They're like, oh God, you look terrible. You look so sleazy. You should have said this. Because when you're on these shows, it's a script. They, they, they're going to ask you the same question over and over and over and over again. My role was, my, the role they had painted for me was I'm the bad guy. I'm supposed to be the bad guy. So I used my training in martial arts and I looked at it as a fight. I'm going to have an argument, but my brain is the weapon. So we prepared for these talk shows. We manipulated the audience into doing the protest march on my house. That was done because the Dahmer stuff was starting to die off. And I had legal fees that I had to pay. I had to pay my lawyer because I got sued by the victim's families. And that shit, that shit was expensive, like 10 grand. And I was right out of college. I, I was a bouncer at a bar. You know what I mean? I, I got a degree in art. I'm publishing books. I, I wasn't wealthy. So uh, I developed this persona and I worked on the salesmanship. And I just got better and better and better at it. And I learned what worked and I learned what didn't work because it either sold or it didn't sell. It, it, it sold or it didn't sell. And I learned early on that whenever I tried to manufacture a controversy, it fell flat on its face. So every time I tried to do something controversial, every time I attempted to get publicity, it didn't work. It absolutely did not work. When I did a taste of cherry for Glenn, to me it's just another horror story. It didn't didn't mean anything to me. I'm reading Clyde Barker, I'm reading John Skip, Craig Spector. I'm reading like hardcore novels. So it, it didn't didn't. But Glenn Glenn knew. Glenn thought he had something because he told the artist. He made sure I want you to draw this girl as an adult. Do not draw the victim in this as some kind of twelve year old looking girl. She needs to be built like an adult woman for legal purposes. Glenn Glenn knew something I didn't know. And so that I had no idea that was going to blow up. I had no idea Planet Comics was targeted because of my work. That's a horrible thing to, to find out that your story that you wrote just to have fun. And, you know, Glenn's like, give me something good. And I'm like, OK, Glenn. So I didn't know that was going to happen. And they seized the Mighty Morphin Rump Rangers. They seized uh, Frank Thorne's Devil's Angel. Uh, they, but they, they targeted me. They were looking for a book by Hart D. Fisher, and it was some Christian group in Oklahoma and was a prosecuting attorney. He was looking for publicity. He was looking for a bump in the ratings. And that's that's what those folks are doing. I'm just being honest about my work and my stories. I'm just trying to make a comic that I want to buy. That's the point is I'm making books that I want to read. And that's why I did Gerard Way's On Raven's Wings. I thought I thought Gary was a good writer. I thought he was really good and really talented. So I, I worked with him for years. I talked with him for years. I remember when he got the job at Vertigo and called me up and I'm like, yeah, one of my Boneyard guys is at Vertigo. This is awesome. I was so happy for him when John Cassidy was working for me. I took John around San Diego Comic-Con and I introduced John to every editor I knew in the business to help his career. And that's something that folks outside of the business don't know about me is I care about my people. I want my people to be successful and I want to do great comics. And that's something I, I hope that I'm, I'm known for is making great comic books. And the salesmanship is that just became a thing. It, it just evolved on its own, like to sell the books, just it kept evolving. And like to get into the magazines, the like wizard wasn't covering me and fan magazine wasn't covering me. So I did a stunt where <laughs> I was working in adult films in the 90s. I was working for an ad company and I was designing the packaging for adult films, the, the VHS boxes, the big, the big clam boxes, the clam shells, the slip cases. I was doing all that graphic design work and uh, shit, I lost my train of thought. Fuck me. 
I'm not even drinking booze. I'm drinking coffee for Christ's sake. You, you, you're selling adult films. Yeah, that I'm in adult films. And so I had access to free porn. All right. Like the companies would let us grab a bunch of porn out of their warehouse. And back in those days, there was no Internet. So this shit was like money. It was money because these things cost money. They were like 50 bucks or 90 bucks. They were expensive. And so I boxed up a big box of porn and I, I put a bottle of Old Crow whiskey in there and I put in two jars of Vaseline and I put in all the Boneyard Press books and I said, all right, you guys, you better share the lube. <laughs> and the next thing you know, I'm writing articles for Fan Magazine because that's, that's a thing. I, I'm one of the only publishers that wrote. I wrote for Fan Magazine. I wrote an article on how to survive as an indie publisher. Uh, I wrote for Comics Journal. I wrote for Hero Illustrated. I wrote for Combo Magazine. So that's a thing I did, and no other publisher did it. And that's promotion, isn't it? I did it to sell the books. Yeah, absolutely. Just, kept getting better at this, and interviewing Frank was great. Frank got really pissy with me when I nailed him on the stuff he ripped off of Mickey Spillane, because Mickey Spillane was my father's favorite writer. I read all those books, Frank. So I know what you stole, you bastard. And it's okay. It, it, he was, it's an homage. It's an homage. Damn it. And I'm like, no, dude, I know what you ripped off. Okay, buddy. I know what you stole. You did Because not many people have read these books anymore. They don't know who Mike Hammer is. It's, it's interesting Man. to think of the, uh, I, I was going to ask you about journalism. Uh, it, mm -hmm. It's interesting to me to think that that's a promotional outlet in a way, uh, you it know, is. getting to getting into these magazines by writing, by contributing content, um, answers one of my questions there. The other I, question I, I had well, for comics. One. Let me give you another one before, before you hit your question. Uh, for folks who don't know, uh, I was the most controversial opinions column writer for the Daily Illini at the U of I. The university paper, my freshman year, I was a columnist, and I got more hate mail than anyone. Anyone. I got the most hate mail and I got so much hate mail, they let me go after one semester. This is a, uh, this is a college publication. Uh -huh. So you're not paid to write for them. You're writing because you're interested nope. in writing, interested in journalism papers. I was interested in commenting on the culture because I felt like one of the things I wrote about was the hypocrisy of their, their artificially created parking problem. There was no parking problem. They just kept putting meters in. They kept putting meters in and blocking off the parking because they made more money on the tickets everybody they make a lot of money on those parking tickets and i have always spoken truth to power uh they had a hard time with me in church church people didn't like me i asked the questions they couldn't answer so that's why i've never been very religious because they're kind of lying and talking out their ass and no i don't believe in the easter bunny i don't believe in santa claus so save your fairy tales for the fairies okay all right Ready? Ready. I want to ask about your perspective on the uh, collapse of the distributors in comics in the late 90s. Uh, anybody unfamiliar with this? Comics probably had maybe 20 distributors, some small regional operations, but you know, today we have one in Diamond Comics. Uh, this happened relatively quickly in the, I don't know, 96, 97, sometime around that time frame where these distributors just went away. As a publisher, do you no, remember? they didn't just go away. I'm going to tell you what happened. Please. Okay. Marvel. Fuck you, Marvel. There's a reason why I did the Kill Marvel book. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, a, I'm the worst kind of thing because I'm a disappointed fan. I'm the worst guy for that because I love Marvel. I grew up make my Marvel. I grew up with Stan Lee. Uh, I've met Stan several times uh, and people go, well, were you, would you mess with him? And I'm like, no, he was a nice old guy. Why would I pick out a nice old man? What the hell's wrong with you people? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't show up at his office with a Marvel can suck my cock shirt on. I didn't do that. That's not professional. That's, that's really uncool. And Duncan Rouleau was working for Stan Lee. That's how I got to go up there. And I was working in the same building as Stan. Uh, but getting back to, to your question, uh, shit, I lost my train of thought. Hit me with your question again. Well, the, the question is about that distributor collapse. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I like... What I'm interested in is I, I know cartoonists who were self-publishing who who kind of quit uh, because of the difficulty that came from distributors <coughs> going out of business and owing them money, them not having these different revenue streams from the multiple distributors. It was it really changed the comics landscape 
And I wonder, yeah. you know, you were there. I wonder what your perspective was, how it affected you, what you remember from that. I remember it vividly. I mean, here's the thing about me. I've got a pretty good memory. And Marvel, okay. <sighs> here comes the speech. Are you ready? Because I've done this before, Jim. All right, here we go. Marvel Comics is responsible for the death of the independent market. They did it on purpose. Okay. Ron Perlman was a corporate raider who bought Marvel in the early 90s. And Marvel was furious at Jim and Todd and Rob and Mark for leaving and starting their own company. They were so angry at them. And I think jealous, you know, I think they were jealous too. And so uh, that's why I say, you know, Todd, Jim, and my, I may have done Kill Image, but I didn't have anything against those guys. Uh, that was from a, a crazy magazine, mad magazine, crack magazine, not brand etch kind of thing. That's where I was coming from when I did Kill Image. It was just meant to be funny. It wasn't meant to be anything more than that. Just my sense of humor can be a little mean sometimes. Uh, it's, it's that South Side of Chicago thing. So Ron Perlman bought Marvel and they were, they were actively wanted to drive the independent publisher into the ground. They hated the indies. They wanted to get rid of them. The first thing they tried was, and I, I talked recently with a guy who worked at Marvel in the 90s, and he knew, he, he knew they were, Marvel decided that your retailer was more likely to buy a Marvel book versus an image book or any other book. So they got the brilliant idea, we're going to physically push the indies off the shelf by publishing so much content, they're, gonna, they're just going to push us off the shelf. And that made me furious. And it hurt a lot of store owners. It really hurt them because a lot of store owners did buy into this and they had a bunch of garbage books they couldn't sell. They're sitting in a, a recycle bin somewhere right now. And I think at one point they were doing 90 books a month, 90 a month. And they were just hiring anybody off the street to draw. There's anyone, you know, they were hiring their buddies, their friends, having their kid take some crayons and draw some stuff. And so that didn't work. It didn't work. And then they tried to buy their competition. Like they bought Malibu comics and they got the idea of, you know what? We don't need retailers. Why would we need a store owner? We're going to create Marvel Marts. So we're going to create Marvel Marts and we're going to buy our own distributor. So the first step for them was they bought a, a the number three publisher in the industry, Heroes World. And Heroes World was based out of New York City. So there was Diamond, there was Capital, there was Heroes World, there was Friendly Franks out of Chicago. Uh, there was Comics Hawaii. And a lot of people don't know, my cousin Ronnie Har owned Comics Hawaii. And he didn't carry Boneyard Press until my aunt saw me, his mom saw me on a talk show, called up her son and said, why aren't you carrying your cousin's books? Ha! So they bought Heroes World and they pulled Marvel out. OK, so that was a chunk of money that all these distributors lost. And Marvel did this on purpose. They wanted those guys gone. They wanted to keep all the money. And Heroes World was an utter debacle, utter, utter debacle. It just just like what's happening now at DC's garbage, the, their distribution is garbage. My retailer friends are so furious, utter, utter crap. These guys at Marvel and DC are, are idiots. They don't know what the hell they're doing. And they never have. They haven't known what they're doing for the last 40 damn years. They don't know what the hell they're doing. You want, you want to know what will be smart? Hire me to run Marvel Comics. I know how to handle that, that brand. I know how to get attention for that brand. And I know how to sell books, you guys. But they, they won't hire me. I'm, I'm uncontrollable. I, I'll do my job and I'll do a good job, but I don't always do what I'm told, especially not from an idiot. I'm the karate master. I break the boards. Not you, dummy. You're not the karate master. If I try to break the boards the way you tell me to, I'm going to break my hand or my foot because you're an idiot and I know how to break the boards. So Heroes World utterly failed. But it started an exclusivity war. And I want you to hear this word, exclusivity war. And this is where I'm furious with my compatriots in the industry because they all decided who they were going to sign up with. Some people signed with Diamond. Some people signed with Capital. And they destroyed the industry with their stupidity. We used to sell way more books. The industry is in terrible shape. Terrible terrible shape there's no money in it until indiegogo until kickstarter and now there's money in it for the, the the creators there's now money in it for uh brian and billy and all the other independents that are doing this for 
everybody that's using this platform, they are now free of the chains of this old distribution system. And so when you are exclusive with one distributor, you are excluding people from buying your book. So not only did distribution disappear, stores disappeared because they couldn't get the product anymore. So every time somebody signed an exclusivity deal with Diamond or Capital, they fucked the fan, they fucked the retailer, and they fucked the business. They were so stupid. And now we're left with just Diamond. And that's a problem. That's a real problem because every time a distributor went under, so did stores. So did your retail outlet. And that's why we have the shitty state of comics we have today with barely any stores around. And that, that's even before the whole lockdown stuff. You know, anybody who's been able to keep a store open during the lockdown, my, my hat is off to you, sir and, and ma'am. You guys are real heroes. The small business owner is the real hero right now in this, this current time because it's a very difficult time to, to be doing business, to, to have a store. So the industry was wrecked by Marvel and wrecked by the dummies who signed exclusive deals with different distributors. That's why we're left with just diamond. End of rant. How much were you selling through those channels that went away? Uh, you know, you talked earlier about selling through head shops and these alternative, uh, what I would think of as alternative outlets, you know, not the direct market, for example. So how much did that affect you? You know, how much did that affect Boneyard's sales? Oh, tremendously. Tremendously. I had to get a job at the ad agency. I couldn't make a living in comics anymore. I had to leave. I, I, I had to leave. I couldn't make a living doing comics. And the, and the okay, so a store goes out of business. In the old days, in ye olden times, when you go to a comic convention, there were actually fans that would show up to buy your books. They didn't show up to have everybody take pictures of themselves in their cosplay outfit. They actually came to meet you and talk with you about your work, which I enjoyed very much. I like meeting the fans. I like talking to the fans. And I, 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 the fans kept me alive uh, through my dark times. It was, it was the fans who kept me going. And it is why I'm so true to myself and so true to my work is because of the fans. So you do a show and at the end of the show, you would go talk to the retailers and they would come up and buy your stuff. So they would buy it for their store, get it? So when the distributors went under and the stores went under, dude, half my revenue went out the door, half of it. It got to the point where no one came by the booth at the end of the show because you, you give a discount, right? And I called it the, I ain't carrying it home discount. I don't want to carry it home. Jesus, buy this stuff. Somebody buy this crap off me. And you'd give them a 50, 60, 75% discount, and they would buy hundreds of books at every show. And that, gone, gone. So that's when I went into the advertising agency. And the reason I got hired at the ad agency was because I was a comic publisher and the guys that did the work, they all liked my books and had my books. So I, I got my job in advertising because of comic books, because I was a comic book star. And it really, really screwed so many people uh, when Friendly Franks, and, and they did, they owed a lot of people money. Like when I was running Verotic, uh, I quit, I quit uh, allowing Frank to buy books because they weren't paying Boneyard Press. Now, if you're not going to pay for the hundred books you bought from Boneyard, why are you going to pay for the thousand books from Verotic? And I remember Frank crying on the phone, oh, you can't do that. And I'm like, hey, if you paid your bill, I'd ship you the books. But I can't because you're not paying your bills. And this, this, we were lucky because Glenn had a bankroll. So Glenn pumped a ton of money into Verotic. Uh, and again, my hat is off to you, Glenn. Uh, he really loves comics too. And he really did the comics he wanted. And in my opinion, the only outlaw publishers, the only real outlaw publishers were EC, Verotic, Boneyard Press, Mike Hunt, because Mike Hunt published Michael Diana. And to me, those were outlaw publishers. And I'd say North Star, uh, the people who did Faust. So I'm gonna say Faust was also an outlaw publisher. And they, they got that title by being banned, by being censored, by being driven out of the industry, by being uh, belittled and ridiculed. That's, that's the definition of an outlaw to me. That's, you know, when, when you've got people saying, you can't sell that on that table. And I, I got harassed at shows all over the country for different products. And that's the interesting thing about censorship is you never know what something's going to tick somebody off. You just don't know. So I, I 
I went out of my way to make the Dahmer book more palatable. The Dahmer, Dahmer case was really distasteful. So I tried to handle a, a distasteful subject matter as tastefully as I could. And when I read that book, I like it. It's a good book. That, that Dahmer book is a, a rock solid book. So losing this distributors drove me out of the business. And that's a big part of why I left in 2004 is they're just, I just couldn't keep doing it anymore. I just couldn't. And I had a new wife and I needed to, to be taking care of my wife. You know what I mean? So I, I had to leave comics and I, I went into adult films and I went into post-production and entertainment. And then in 2008, I got the contract to do the American Horror television show. And so now, I mean, come on, Jim, you haven't read about American horrors in any horror magazine and any publication. And I had 2 million viewers for the month of August. I am eating shutters lunch. We are worldwide. France was the number one country watching for, for like the last month. Uh, you haven't read about my work with Billie Eilish in any press publication. There's been nothing. They're like, why is Billie Eilish so dark? Why are her lyrics so dark? Oh, gosh. Oh, gee. She grew up next door to me. Next door. She was homeschooled. She was the hippie vegan kid next door. Finny and Billy grew up next door to me. I launched American Horrors from the house next door to them. It was old craftsman houses with single pane casement windows. I heard everything in their house. They heard everything in my house. And I play my movies loud. When I'm watching horror movies, it's loud. And the American Horrors channel, when you're running your own TV channel, I have my channel on right now. It's on over there. It's on all the time so I can monitor the network, so I can keep an eye on the network and make sure it's running properly. And I love my TV channel the same way I love doing comics. I love horror. I, I love the movies. It's so much fun. Uh, and that's what I do. I do what I love. And that's probably why I'm so intense about it. Well, that's probably a good place to wrap up, Hart. I am, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, we're, get, we're getting to the end of the time here. Um, where should people go to find more of your work? Well, uh, definitely go to the Kickstarter right now. Uh, like I mentioned, Mark Bloodworth has got new work that's going to be in Buildable. Uh, it's, it's some of the first work from Duncan Rouleau, from Jim, John Cassidy, uh, J what's called Jason Moore. Uh, Bill, Bill Nichols, uh, so many people. We got work from Rick Veach in there. Uh, I'm the writer of almost all the stories. It's me, Lance Poland, and Bill Yukich were the writers of this stuff. And it's fun. The Buildable book is a lot of fun. If you're a fan of the Hellboy movies, then you're going to like Buildable very, very much. And uh, the Kickstarter, it, it's, it's cool. It, go to the Kickstarter, look up Hart D. Fisher's Buildable Omnibus, Contribute Today, uh, we did hit our funding goal, but I've got really cool stretch rewards. We've got really neat vinyl stickers and we've got really cool bookmarks and buttons. And we just decided now to do poker chips because build a bowl plays cards. So we're going to do some poker chips. Thank you for the, the advice on that one, Max DeVille. So go to boneyardpress2020.com is a good place to go. That's boneyardpress2020.com or go to americanhorrorsfilmfestival.com. Uh, we're in our fifth year of my American Horrors Film Festival. You're going to be able to get tickets there. We're in Lake Geneva, in downtown Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, which is right outside of Chicago. And uh, look, look me up on uh, YouTube. I also have two YouTube channels. So if you want to see me on Larry King, if you want to see me school Sally, Jesse, Raphael, because I do within the first minute and a half of being on the air, go to www.youtube.com backslash crime pays heart. There's also youtube.com backslash American Horrors. There's also a Twitter that I just recently reactivated. So there's a new Boneyard Press Twitter and there's Hart underscore Fisher Twitter. So I'm, I'm on social media. I'm on Instagram, but I got to warn you, I've got some nude shots up on my Instagram. So if you don't want to see my naked butt, don't go to Hart Fisher's Instagram <laughs> at all. Don't go there at all. Because we did a whole thing, naked making bacon, uh, to have some fun with the COVID lockdown. So if you do want to see my butt naked, making bacon, go to the Instagram. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, Hart. And I'm on Facebook, too. I'm on Facebook also. Good luck with the Kickstarter. Thanks, Jim. I'm so happy to be here. It's great. Kayfabers, like, follow, and subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube channel. Click the bell icon to be notified of new videos or live streams. Pick up Ed Piscor's Red Room wherever you buy your comics. You can pre-order the Red Room trade paperback from Fanagraphics through October 12th and save 20% with the promo code 
Red Room 20. You can also join Ed on patreon.com slash edpiscor where you can read Red Room ahead of time with weekly updates on Tuesday. I think five issues are available now. That is $3 a month. Patreon.com slash edpiscor. You can join me on patreon.com slash jimrug or you can download out of print zines and mini comics. You can see my original art, scripts, and process posts to see how I make the comics I make like Street Angel and Octobriana. That is patreon.com slash jimrug. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Until next time, make more comics.